We are The Point, a church that loves God, loves people, and loves life. If you are interested in learning more about us, please go to our website, thepointva.com. Thanks for listening. So today we are beginning a brand new series that we're calling You're Grounded. And this is a series all about how to parent teenagers. It's very simple. You're grounded, right? It, it, I thought it was funnier than uh, your response, but... Um, it's, it's, not, it's not just that, okay? Although parenting teenagers is gonna be part of, of this discussion that we're starting this morning. This is really a series all about family. And what does it look like to be grounded on the truth of the Word of God? Grounded in the sense of a foundation upon the truth of the Word of God. Uh, for where we are right now in life, maybe you're single, you one day wanna be married, or maybe you're married, you wanna have children, or maybe you've got children that are in transition and, and going into a new season of life. Life or, you know, whatever the case is, maybe you've entered into the season of empty nesting or grandparenting. And so what does it look like to really build a foundation for family upon the truth of the Word of God? And a couple of things you need to know about as we dive into the series. One, you've heard it mentioned, but next Sunday night, the parenting seminar. If you're a parent, grandparent, you one day want to be a parent, you need to make sure that you're here next Sunday night for this seminar. We need you to register because space is limited. It's free, uh, but space is going to be limited for this event. But what does it look like to parent with grace and truth in such a confused uh, culture that, that we live in? And so that's going to be part of this series. And so I just want to say that from the beginning, that if I'm honest with you, if I'm honest with you, I feel very inadequate when it comes to having this discussion. Because Carrie and I, even, you know, we've been married for 18 years. We're parents of, of children ages 11 all the way down to, to three. Like there's so many days that we feel in over our head when it comes to family and, and parenting. So many days that we just feel in over our head. Like what are, what are we doing? Are we doing it right? And we're asking all of, all of these, these questions. And so we wrestle with those types of insecurities just like um, all of us, all of us do. You know, as we think about this, I think about uh, questions, like things we know we should be doing, for example, um, we know even as a married couple, like we should be prioritizing a date night. And, and then we know that we should, based on what you read, that you should have time with your, all of your kids, like very, very often. But we're just like you and that we know these things, but then you look at your schedule and it's like, okay, I know what I need to do, but how is it gonna fit? Are you with me? So there's that tension. And then there's the tension of adding on culture and what kids are facing, this generation is facing when it comes to, to culture it, it itself. And so it can just be a really kind of challenging discussion. Very, very challenging. But you know, another reason why a discussion on family can be challenging is because the word family is not an emotionally neutral word. Think about that. Then when I say the word family, there, are, there is a wide range of emotions that are right now surfacing. For some of you, like it's very positive. Like I have got a great family and things are going relatively well and so on. But there's a lot of people, when they hear the word family, what they think is dysfunction or they think chaos or they think fighting. You know, maybe right now your mind went to the relationship with your in-laws and how you wish it were better than, than what it is. Or maybe you're thinking about the recent divorce you went through or maybe a divorce from many years ago. Now you're remarried and you're working through what does it look like to have a blended family? Or maybe you're right now single. You one day want to be married. Maybe even when you've been waiting on God for a while and you're, you're kind of like looking like, God, are you ever going to provide? Or maybe you're going through the pain and you believe that God is going to give you children and you're waiting on that promise, but it, it hasn't happened yet. Like it could be just a really, really challenging uh, discussion for a number of reasons. And it's with, with all of these thoughts in mind that what I want to do today is take us into the Psalms, beginning with Psalm 90. So if you have your Bible, you can turn there. And if you don't, the words will be on the screen for you. But we're gonna to step today into Psalm 90. And if you've been with us for a while, you know that earlier this summer, we taught a series called Summer in the Psalms. And we did some teaching on Sundays and then we launched the entire church into a reading plan where we're reading through the Psalms every day, praying through the Psalms and applying the Psalms. And today what I want to do is I wanna revisit the Psalms and I wanna kind of lay a foundation for us. What does it look like to be grounded? Okay, grounded on the truth of God's word when it comes to family, to relationships, to marriage, parenting, grandparenting, and, 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 and so on. Now I've taught 
a lot of nuances around the Psalms. Okay, a few literary techniques and how to read the Psalms and so on. One detail that I have not taught you yet regarding the Psalms, it's a very important one, is how the books or how the Psalms rather are arranged into different books. Okay, so a long time ago, when the Jewish people were putting the Psalms together, when they were bringing them together, they arranged them into five different books. Why five? Well, it's believed that just as Moses gave us the five books of the law, they see David as having given us the five books of the Psalms. Now, David didn't write all of the Psalms, but he wrote, wrote many of them. But that's why it's believed that they were arranged into these five different books. So what are the five different books? Okay, we're gonna go through them relatively quickly. So get ready to write them down. Book one is, is Psalms one through 41. Book two, Psalms 42 to 72. Book three, Psalms 73 to 89. I'm gonna come back to that book in a moment. Very important for today's discussion. And then book four, Psalms 90 to 102. Book four is where we're stepping in today in Psalm 90. And you're gonna see in a moment the reason why. And then book five, book five rather, Psalms 107 to, to 150. So let me explain book three very, very quickly. The majority of the Psalms in book three are Psalms of lament. Okay, Psalms of, of brokenness. In fact, the best way to think of book three is to think of it as a crisis of faith, a crisis of faith. Now, I don't know if you've ever gone through a crisis of faith, but what a crisis of faith is, is when you know the truth of the word of God, you know the promises of God's word, you even know the character of God, but you're having a hard time reconciling what you know about God and his word with what your current experience is. Okay, that's a crisis of faith. And at some point in time, as, as followers of Jesus, every one of us is gonna have to go through that. Where even when we do not understand his activity, we still trust his character. And it's not easy, but that's what you call spiritual growth. That's what you call spiritual formation. So that's what book three is. Well, what exactly is happening in book three? Okay, a couple of Psalms to write down. Psalm 74 and 79. These Psalms reference the destruction of the temple of God. Now that may not land for you and I, but for the people of God in the Old Testament, all of life centered on the temple. So you're talking about the main pillar of their life and the destruction of that, okay? Again, a crisis of, of, of faith. Psalm 89, write that down, which if, if you've taken notes, you realize Psalm 89 is at the end of book three. Psalm 89 speaks of the fall of the Davidic monarchy. So what's the significance of that? Well, if you know the Old Testament, you know that God gave King David a promise that his throne would be established forever. And here in Psalm 89, in this section, the crisis of faith, what happens? God's people are carried away into Babylonian captivity. And when it comes to the line of David, it looks like it's been brought to an end. Now we know based on history that God was true to his promise to King David, that he always kept someone alive in the lineage of David because God is true to his word, amen? He's always true to his word. God cannot lie. If there's never a time when God can't be true to his word, this is God's character in nature, but it wasn't looking good. The crisis of faith is this, is when you know his promises, but you're still feeling let down by him. It's when... You're feeling disappointment and frustration and confusion and loss of hope. Like, what do you do when life takes the turn that you weren't expecting? Like, when, when, what do you do when, when things don't turn out the way that you had hoped and your faith gets shaken? Okay, that's book three. And book four, starting in Psalm 90, is a response to that crisis of faith. So this is what we're stepping into, a response to the crisis of faith. And here's the message of book four. The message is, is Yahweh was on the throne then, before there was a King David, before there was a temple, before the people of God were in the land of Israel. Yahweh was on the throne then, and Yahweh's on the throne now. Amen. Yahweh was on the throne on the mountaintop, and Yahweh's still on the throne in the valley. Yahweh is on the throne in the good times, 
and Yahweh is still on the throne in your disappointment. This is the message of book four, which is why we look at verse number one of Psalm 90. Moses, who's the author of this Psalm, says this, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Dwelling place means resting place. The one in whom our soul finds rest. You have been our dwelling place throughout all generations before the mountains were born or you brought forth the whole world from, read this with me, everlasting to everlasting. Come on, we can do better. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Now, what I wanna do this morning as we look at Psalm 90, Psalm 91 and Psalm 92 is I wanna share one simple truth from all three of these Psalms on how we have to be grounded in the truth of God's word. And the first one is this, you should write this down. We have to be grounded in God's perspective. You have to be grounded in God's perspective. In the crisis of faith, you have to be grounded in God's perspective. You see, what's gonna happen is the next several verses of this Psalm they are a reminder from Moses that life is very brief and is full of trouble. Like how many of you learned, have learned over time, it's like through life, you're either in the midst of a trial, you're going into one, or you're just coming out of one, about to go into another one, right? This is what Moses is saying, is that man's days are brief and they are full of trouble. But look at what happens in Psalm 90. Moses doesn't start with his problems. He starts with God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. He starts with God's eternal perspective. And many of us, we begin our day with our problems, with our disappointments, with our frustrations. And I'm not discounting what it is that you're going through. But what Moses is teaching us is that all of those things in life need their proper context. And that proper context is God's eternal perspective. You see, this is, what, this is what Paul was teaching us in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is what? He's eternal. We have to be grounded in God's perspective. All of our problems in life, all of the disappointments, the loss of hope, the frustrations, you can't face them without the context of God's eternal perspective. So Psalm 91. Now, we don't know for sure who wrote Psalm 91. Although many people attribute Psalm 91 to Moses as well. And the reason being is because the language in Psalm 91 is very similar to the language in Deuteronomy. So it's a likelihood that Moses was the author of Psalm 91. And here's the, re- here's the observation I want you to write down from Psalm 91. The observation is this, grounded in God's protection. Would you say it with me? Grounded in God's protection. Let me just say that if you want a psalm to pray over your marriage, if you want a psalm to pray over your children, if you want a psalm to pray over your uh, family, if you want a psalm to pray over your relationships, if you want a psalm to pray over anyone who matters most to you, I would encourage you to pray Psalm 91 over them, grounded in God's protection. In fact, our group leaders are in this service and they remind us often Carrie and I and our entire group, that they are praying Psalm 91 over our marriages and over our children. Which by the way, that's why everybody needs to be in a group. Because what we've asked our group leaders to do is pray over their group and their families every day by name. And so I just want you to imagine this with me. A church of the size that we have, if you're plugged into a group, everybody who's part of a group is being prayed for every day by name. And all of us need that, amen? Amen. Well, I need it. We all need that. Every one of us needs that. So let's look at Psalm 91 in verse number two. I will say of the Lord, 
He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Now, I taught two months ago from Psalm 46. Remember, Psalm 46 is the Psalm that says, uh, God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in time of trouble. And remember the picture of the imagery of a refuge is running to a refuge or running to a fortress in, in a time of trouble. And if you, don't, if you don't remember me teaching that, that was the Sunday that I told the story about the night that I made this brilliant decision as a dad to watch Jurassic Park with our kids before we went to bed. Remember that? Now, our three-year-old son used to like dinosaurs, but we're watching that movie and, and, and he says, Daddy, I don't like this movie. And he said, I, you know, I said like, oh, you'll be okay. Like you, lo you love dinosaurs, remember? You love dinosaurs. And Carrie gave me that look. She's like, I don't think this is a good idea. I was like, he'll be, he'll be fine, he's got this. And sure enough, the middle of the night, what happens? His little bedroom door flies open and his, you can hear his little feet. I'll never forget hearing that little, little feet running down the hallway. And he jumps up in bed with mommy and daddy. And that's the picture of God being our refuge and our strength, where we run to him in times of trouble. Okay, now that's good imagery, but what does it look like, like practically or spiritually for God to be our refuge and strength? And the psalmist tells us, look at Psalm 91 two again. He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I what? Trust, very important word, trust. Now, the danger for many of us is that we have walked with Jesus for some time. Not everybody, but many of us have walked with Jesus for a period of time. And we hear a word like trust and we just kind of quickly pass by it. We really don't stop to think, okay, what does that mean? And let me tell you what it means to trust. To trust means to submit, write that down. To trust means to submit, which means this, I choose to trust or to submit to his word. Regardless of what my feelings say, I still choose to submit to his word and I submit to his authority. I choose God's way. I choose his way over my feelings. I choose his authority even over what the world might suggest. To trust means I'm all in on God and his ways. And if you wanna be grounded in God's protection, you've gotta determine that you're gonna to submit to him and to his authority over your life, no matter the cost. You say, but if I do that, then what decisions am I gonna have to make as a result? I'm not saying it won't require courage. It'll require great courage. But I'm telling you, if you want what's best for your life, you want God's way for you. And as hard as it can be, and as unpopular as it could be, if you wanna be under his protection, then that means you have to trust or submit to his authority. I want you to think about this for a moment. Like what's, what tactic does the enemy do, use to try to derail us? And it's, it's not rocket science. We see it all throughout the word of God. In fact, you see it in Genesis chapter three. In Genesis three, the very first time, I mean, Adam and Eve, they have this perfect relationship with God. It doesn't get any better than what they have right there in front of them. And the enemy comes, and what does he say to, him, say to them? Did God really say? And what tactic does the enemy do, use? He wants to undermine the authority of the word of God in your life. To really cause you to call into question, is God's word and his authority really best for me? And let me just tell you that if you want God's protection under, over your life, if you want his will for your life, that means that you've got to choose his authority for your life. And I just think about it in light of the world that we're in that's attempting to redefine so many things, especially around the dynamics of, of gender and sexuality and marriage and family, like things that God's word is already clear on. Like it's not up for debate, like God has already spoken. And the enemy is constantly trying to undermine the authority of the word of God in our lives. So we say, well, like I know what God's word says, but, but I, I don't like it. It doesn't change the fact it's the truth of God's word. 
I don't like when God's word confronts the impatience in my life, but it's still the truth of the word of God. Are you with me? I mean, every one of us, if we're reading the word of God, then we're gonna be constantly confronted with the truth of God's word. And there are gonna be things that, that surface in our lives. Well, I, I don't like what it says. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't change that it's the truth of the word. And there's so many of us, we are confronted every day with this decision. Am I gonna do it my way or God's way? And I don't know about you, but every time I've done it my way, I've created a huge mess. In fact, there's a lot of us, like right now, we're faced with disappointment or frustration and, and you've been waiting on God, maybe for a marriage, maybe for children, maybe for a relationship. Like you've been waiting on God for something. You've been waiting on God for the breakthrough. And when we're waiting, like when we're in that crisis of faith, it's very, very easy to find ourselves wanting to take the pressure of provision upon ourselves. Don't do that. The pressure of provision is this, well, God hasn't provided yet, so maybe I should take matters into my own hands. And I'm telling you that every time I have taken upon myself the pressure of provision, I've regretted it. I've had to pay a great price. There are consequences to it. And then you learn the lesson, you get back up and you move forward. But I'm, I'm telling you, I wanna encourage you, don't take the pressure of provision upon yourself. One of the greatest examples of this happening in the Bible is when you go back to, 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 to the promise that God made to Abraham, that I'm gonna make you the father of a great nation. And so he's waiting on God and waiting on God and waiting on God. Well, God, how can I father a great nation? I can't even father a child. He gets tired of waiting, so what does he do? He says, well, I'm gonna take matters into my own hands. I'm gonna sleep with my servant Hagar. And from that relationship comes Ishmael. Later on, God provided, just as he said he would, the child of promise, Isaac. But if you take that relationship with Hagar and Ishmael, and then you take Isaac and you trace those two lineages through all the generations to the present time, and do you know that all the conflict that exists right now in the Middle East can be traced back to Abraham taking the pressure of provision upon himself? Thousands of years of conflict as a consequence of one man making that decision. I've heard stories of so many recently who took the pressure of provision upon themselves when it came to marriage and they step into marriage completely unprepared. And now they look back at several, several stories recently of how they wish they would have waited or they wish they'd have done more soul work or they wish they hadn't have gone through with it to begin with. I wanna encourage you, don't take the pressure of provision upon yourself. You submit to God and his word and his ways and stay under his protection. So as we close this morning, what I wanna do is step into Psalm 92 and we're gonna land here today. But Psalm 92 has the title of for the Sabbath day. Now in God's word, the Sabbath is, is associated with the law of God. Well, who is the one whom through the law was given? Moses is the great lawgiver. Therefore, it's a possibility that Moses was the one who wrote Psalm 92 as well. I wanna step in this morning in Psalm 92, verse number 12. The righteous will flourish, thrive like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon, planted, everybody say planted, in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God and they will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh, and green. And I had this thought when I was reading this verse. Every one of us, myself included, is planted somewhere. We're all planted somewhere. And we have to do the hard work of determining where it is exactly that we're planted. Do you know why? Because the soil in your life matters. And what hinges on it is whether your life will bear the fruit that God intended it to bear planted in the house of the Lord, planted in the courts of our God. Now, there's two things I wanna say about that this morning. Number one, I believe that for all of us, grandparents, parents, adults, children, students, college students, now more than ever, we need to return to being planted in the house of God. 
I'm not just talking spiritually, I'm talking physically. We need our, we need our kids planted again, physically, in the house of God. And we've got to return to the place where it becomes the habit of our lives. Are you with me? I take that as a yes. There are so many voices that are competing for your attention. Think about all the voices that are competing for the attention of your children and your students. All the, way the, all the ways the enemy is attempting to derail them that you're not even aware of. Not even aware of. And we believe here at the point that, that the role of discipleship, like primarily that's your role in the home, but I want you to know that we're a close second because we want to come alongside of you and shepherd and minister to your children and your students as well. I want you to know that we're, we're in this together, okay? And by the way, that's true for you 20-somethings and 30-somethings. Some of you that are still single or you're newly married and you one day you want to be married. Let me just tell you, like in a couple of weeks, we're going to be, I'm going to be preaching a message specifically for you. And so in two weeks, you want to make sure you're here for that message, and then we're going to be launching something very, very special uh, for you in the, in the coming months. But I just want all of you to know that we are very intentionally planning and thinking of what does it look like for us to come alongside of all of us and to walk with us in this, this journey of, of discipleship. But I'm going to tell you, if you've got one foot in and one foot out, you're not going to experience it. It's time to return to being planted in the house of God. Amen? But here's the thing I want you to write down from Psalm 92, it's this. That ultimately what this means is it means to be grounded in God's presence. To be planted in the house of God means to be grounded in God's presence, which means that I see the presence of God as the greatest prize in my life. The greatest prize is not a promotion. The greatest prize is not an education. The greatest prize is not the man of my dreams or the one of my dreams. The greatest prize is not children. The greatest prize is not whatever it is that you have in your mind. If I only had that, then I would be fulfilled. None of that is the greatest prize in life. The greatest prize is the presence of God. And living in a moment by moment awareness and intimacy and relationship with God. That's the greatest prize in life. And that's the message of Psalm 92, to be grounded in the presence of God. And let me tell you that when you're grounded in the presence of God, everything in life, else in life, begins to fall into its proper place. When you're grounded in the presence of God, walking moment by moment in relationship and intimacy with him, what you begin to find is the words of Jesus is true. Matthew 6, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things will be added. And I don't know what all the other things are for you, but the promise of God's word is that when you prioritize Jesus and the kingdom, that everything else in life, everything will find its proper place and perspective in your life. We have to be grounded in the presence of God. When you look at the journey of Israel throughout the Old Testament, and when you look at this crisis of faith they went through, when they, were, when they were stripped of the land and they were stripped of the temple, and even when it looked like that the Davidic monarchy had fallen completely, when it looked like there was no longer any hope, what, what had God done? He had stripped them of all the physical things. And there's so many of us that are looking to the physical things, the physical signs, and we lean more on those in trust than we do our spiritual reality in the presence of God. And it's so easy, we drift towards trying to squeeze meaning out of those things. Purpose, fulfillment. Out of things that cannot possibly provide that for us. And what happens when we do? When we do, we begin to wither. The soul withers. And when we do that, the people around us that we love the most and that we care for the most, they begin to pay a great price. And so... It's time to return being grounded in God's perspective, his protection, and his presence. You know, recently I heard Pastor Chris Hodges share results from a survey that they had taken at their church regarding things that teenagers wish their parents knew about them. Things that teenagers are just kind of quietly carrying around that the parents have no clue about. And here's what one said. 
I wish my parents knew that even though my actions don't show it, I desperately wanted to please them. Another said, I wish my parents knew how much I love them, even though I don't always say it. I wish my parents knew how much I treasure their advice, even when I acted like I couldn't care less. I wish my dad knew how much I love holding his hand, even when I would act like it embarrassed me in front of my friends. I wish my parents knew when they wouldn't let me date that guy and I got mad, I was really thankful they were fighting for me. I wish my parents knew that instead of threatening to punish me, I needed them to do it. I wish my parents knew how hard it is to stay pure. I wish my parents knew the evil that I face every day. Let me encourage us now more than ever. We've got to be grounded in the truth and the authority and the wisdom and the instruction of the Word of God. And today what we're doing is we're beginning a discussion that's going to continue over the next several weeks. But as I close this morning, where, I, where this ultimately all begins is in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you've never made that decision, maybe you've been trying and struggling and trying to control and engineer and put things together and you're striving and you're striving and you're striving and you're exhausted as a result. Today, Jesus wants to be your resting place. And so if you've never made a decision to trust Jesus as Lord and Savior, this is where this begins. And I'm gonna give you the opportunity to say yes to him for the first time today. So let's stand to our feet here in Charlottesville and in Louisa. If you're watching online, don't rush off. And God, we wanna say thank you for this morning. We wanna say thank you for your word. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. Thank you for the authority of your word. And thank you, Father, that even when we don't agree or we don't like it, God, your word is still best for us. Your word is still truth. And so God, I pray right now as your word has gone forth that you would penetrate our hearts very deeply with it. That God, you would take it into the deep places of our hearts. That God, you would expose, Lord, any area of our lives where we've taken matters into our own hands. Any way that we've taken the pressure of provision upon ourselves. And that God, we would repent. That we would have a change of mind that would lead to a change of direction. God, our heart is that we want to do it your way. We want to, we want to do relationships your way. We want to do marriage your way. We want to do parenting grandparenting your way, Lord. We want to do it your way. God, our way doesn't work and we don't want it anymore. We want your way, Lord. And so today, God, we return to your word, to your truth, to your authority over our lives. Forgive us, God, for all the times that we've taken things into our own hands. God, we return to you today. And God, I pray especially for those who have never made a decision to trust you as Lord and Savior. You've brought them to this moment right now in time to cross the line of faith and say yes to you, surrendering complete control. Father, draw them right now. Holy Spirit, do a work within. They couldn't resist your love any longer. So as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, everybody's very still and quiet. You've never said yes to Jesus. And today you're ready to give up control of your life to him as Lord and as Savior. I'm going to lead you to prayer right now. I'm going to ask you to do something very courageous, and that is pray this prayer out loud after me. And then I'm going to rest, ask the entire church family to pray it out loud as well, just in support of you who are praying this for the first time today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for sending him to die on the cross for my sin. I believe he died for me. 
that he rose again. Come into my heart, take control of my life. I wanna live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen.